Okay. Uh, Mr. Phillips, do you have any comments? Okay. Uh, Ms. Auger, I had uh, one question for you. you. You used a term I wasn't quite familiar with. You said that if a teacher was a lateral entry teacher, what, what does that entail? Mm -hmm. Okay. A lateral entry teacher, for example, might be someone who majored in that subject, let's say math, but did not complete a teacher education program in math. Um, so given that math teachers might be rarer than uh, another category, um, if we were to hire a math teacher being someone with a math degree but not teacher education background, then we work with them more closely on all aspects of um, their teaching during that those first couple of years. Okay. Well, that's that, that's good to hear that we have that that uh, option uh, of uh, bringing people in that, that way. Um, just to, as nothing to do your plan, I like it. Uh, I'll vote for it, but uh, I do want to just point out kind of the sorry state that this state is in in terms of supporting beginning teachers. Um, I think one of the best things that we could do at the end of a, of a successful year with a teacher is to say, okay, you did well, we want you back next year, and we're giving you a step increase so that you will make more money next year than you did the year before. That used to be the case in North Carolina, and I believe that we've gone four or now maybe five years, because I don't think that there's a plan for step increases for the next school year. So we will be the teachers that are now in their fifth year will be making the same salary that they did on their first year. And I would suggest that they probably are more experienced and therefore more effective and deserve a higher pay than a beginning teacher. Um, I also had a question about how much were mentors making before we stopped giving them a supplement because the state stopped giving us a supplement. A hundred dollars a month, right? So about a thousand dollars a year, and then okay. an extra hundred dollars for the um, orientation. Okay, so they because they come in special mm -hmm. for that. All right, thank you. All right, thank you, uh, Mr. Phillips, uh, and I'll just uh, not to put you on the spot, but. Uh, Courtney, do you have any comments that you'd like to make about beginning teachers or some of the support or some of the things that you've seen during your career? Um, absolutely. I was lucky enough to be a part of the mentor program in Cabarrus County, both as a beginning teacher and now as a mentor. And you, you, cannot, you cannot possibly understand the support needs that a beginning teacher needs and how this program absolutely fulfills those needs. Um, as we progress in our teaching. One of the things that keeps us alive and learning more things is with new teachers. And so as a mentor, you're reinv reinvigorated and um, it's a great program. Um, it's absolutely a fantastic program. I plan to take many of those things back to my school um, that we saw today. So thank you very much for that. Great. Thank you very much for your comments. And that, that, that really dovetails nicely into what I, my thoughts are. You know, it doesn't matter who you are and what your profession is or really how far up the rung that you've gone. It's human nature to want to feel appreciated and want to be able to know that if you need something or if you've got some help or somebody that you can, whether it's walking into the corner office of your boss or knowing that the principal or the AP or the lead teacher or somebody in your realm and sphere of influence cares about what you're doing and will help answer questions and talk to you about where you're going. So that's the the the... the the list and, and what you guys are doing at, at, at Walking Cup. I love just to being the proactive of, hey, here's a coupon to cash in one time because we know you're going to be stressed out. You know, it, it, it's your job and it's what you signed up for. But you know what? We can give you a break every now and then or, or help you out. And that just that kind of thing to me, I, I would imagine, goes a long way to help uh, uh, teacher morale, um, especially in light of what what, what Jeff mentioned. Um, you know, just in the last five years, the cost of goods and services that you're buying every day is going up and your pay is staying the same that's just a, that's a double whammy and uh you know hopefully we we can get some way shape or form get some relief to uh the teachers that have such a impact on our students so anyway with that said we this is an action item so we need to move on it so uh, i will ask for a motion that we approve the beginning teacher plan as presented to us. I make a motion we approve the plan. So second. A motion and a second. So all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Ms. Monroe carries uh, six to zero, and that plan has been approved. So we will now go to 7.2.
We will call Dr. Chris Louder to the podium for his inaugural trip down Policy Lane. <laughs> and we welcome you and uh, uh, thank you for being here. I appreciate that. And, and along the lines of the inaugural visit, I just want to start by thanking um, Dr. Sane. As we've worked on this and work on the transition, Dr. Sane and Sue Burns, who is the parent relations coordinator in our office, really did the groundwork for the, the policies that are in front of you tonight. We just wanted to kind of keep those coming so you wouldn't be inundated with those. Ms. Monroe was actually very helpful, too, in just getting things in the right um, format to get to you guys. So um, again, Next month or so, as some of the ones have been initiated, we'll try to make that as smooth as possible. Um, having said that, there are six policies that are in front of you, and I don't, I'm not exactly sure how you want to proceed. I know you've had these for about a week. If you just want to um, start, and if you have questions about any of these or anything we want to clarify to, to try to move through those. Board members, we want to just pepper him with questions or anything. I guess just pick a policy or a specific. We're talking, well, let's just start at the top. Does anybody have anything on 3120? Okay, Jeff. Um, I have a question. It's really the, it, so I know this came up in our very first board meeting for four of us, wow. and uh, I had complained because we were adding things to the uh, to the lesson plan without taking anything off. It looks like you're dropping G and uh, adding the uh, well. C is effective use of technological resources. What what used to be at C? There's no strike over there, so I'm wondering what the yeah, the, again, that's just, a, um, I think, one addition that's added from the State School Board Association to kind of just update that a little bit and make it a little more modern. Okay. Uh, the, the other thing, and I brought this up also at the time that it came up the last time, a um, couple of paragraphs down, it says, pursuant to the school improvement plan, every full-time assigned classroom teacher must be provided duty-free instructional planning time with the goal of providing at least an average of at least five hours of planning time per week. How well are we doing on that goal? Yeah, and I know this is something that you raised earlier, and I was going to ask uh, Dr. Van Heuchelum to come up and address that. This is something that he's really worked um, diligently on to try to move forward on, and he, he knows the most about that. We're just going to let him talk about the details. Uh, we're making progress in that area. Um, we're not where we need to be. Um, we did a survey of our elementary schools uh, yesterday, and uh, I think 90% of them are going to be able to get 50 minutes a day of planning for their teachers. Uh, we have 50. I'm sorry. Five, five zero. Five zero. Okay. 50, yes. 50 minutes a day. So still under the five hours a week. Um, we were able to do that by allocating two additional Encore teachers to the elementary uh, group. Um, in addition, we are going to be creative and, and uh, do some special contracts for some of those Encore positions, allowing principals the flexibility to hire uh, an individual for six hours a week or, or something like that, uh, positions that don't require benefits, et cetera. Still, elementary is not where I would like to see them. It requires some more teachers to make that happen. Of course, middle school and high school are, are fine, um, but we're making progress. So what, what's preventing the other 10% of the elementary schools from reaching this same level? Because it seems to me it's rather, uh, well, it, it, not only is it unoptimal, it almost seems unfair that, that we're paying teachers the same amount of money right. at two different schools, and it's like you get 50 minutes of playing time a day, and you don't. Well, and some of that has to do with the priorities that the school sets through the school improvement team and what they choose to do. So, for example, um, they will double block planning so they can have a longer period of time on one day and then no time on another day. So um, some schools have chosen to take that route, which over the time uh, means it averages out to a little bit less. But the teachers at that particular school say, we value this hour and a half chunk of time because we're going to get more work done than a 50 minutes every day. Um, so a couple schools still really value that, and they have the right to do that through their um, school improvement team, and they vote on that as a staff. So that's the only discrepancy there. And to get us to the to more playing time across the board would require more encore teachers. So, okay, Dr. Shepard, you got I a would, comment? Jason, when you come come back, we say you spoke into the elementary piece, but with the high school and the middle school piece, what would be our district wide average if we were to consider that? I mean, there, there's a significant amount of planning time at those two levels so absolutely I mean the middle school and high school would if we were to take k-12 and average them together we would meet our our goal of five hours a week because if you think of the high school folks they get 90 minutes a day so they're getting five six seven eight eight hours a week 
when you average that together. Yeah. And middle school gets 60 to 70, depending on their schedule. Yeah. Okay. Does anybody have a comment on 3620? Okay. 4150? Oh. Oh, I just had one comment. I just wanted to... Which one are you on? On the, the, the one we were just on. 3120 lesson planning? Yeah. Okay. Um, I just wanted you all to know that, you know, we've had some discussions and we've heard had some emails about Common Core, but listed right in here is Cabarrus County Schools curriculum maps. Our county does the curriculum. We're only adapting to a standard through the curriculum and Jason's team has been writing all this past week and they've done had 150 teachers that were over writing curricula this week or actually last week they might still be there this week <laughs> but I, I really my hats off but the content of the standard is nothing compared to what the content of the curriculum is and so we are we still have control as a local entity of the curriculum what the materials are. The teachers actually have a lot of flexibility to provide the materials that they feel are necessary to meet the standards so that, you know, we have control at a local level. And I know there's been a lot of press saying we don't have control and we, we really do have some control. So I want y'all to know that. I'm sorry. Thank you, Barry. Carolyn, will you key down? Yeah. Okay. Uh, 3620. Let's see. I think we already passed on that one. 4150. Actually, nope. I did want to Bring okay. Up 3620. Um, is is this the policy in which we dictate the um, GPA standards, minimum GPA standards that a student has to have in order to compete in uh, athletic programs? I, I don't. It's not specifically listed here. I don't think, but it does talk about interscholastic athletics. So I, I don't know exactly where the. Like currently, we do not have a local GPA minimum standard. There is a state standard with the High School Athletic Association, but we do not have a, a board um, passed minimum GPA requirement. Okay, and what, what is the state standard? Uh, the, they ultimately have to pass three out of four classes. So And, you can, and a D is a passing grade, right? right? So right. you can have three Ds and an F. Can you get into an NCAA? Um, Scholarship no. program with that kind of grades? No. So, so we're really leading some students down a, a dead end path by allowing them to continue to compete when they have that kind of a of a grade point average. Well, I think if if Brian or Donna would hear, um, and some of our coaches would say, you know, if if they were going to be a college athlete, that might be the case. But there's quite a few students who would fit into that category who. Um, you know, are coming to school because of that. Now, I'm not saying that their grades in that situation are what we want them to have, but uh, I can certainly tell you from, you know, being a high school principal experience where you may have a freshman or a sophomore that begins in that ballpark and then works with a coach and works with a mentor, and two years later they've got a, you know, a B average because they were pulled in. Um, now, there are certainly arguments on both sides of that, but um, so, no, that, that would not prepare them for that, but there are students who begin – one year and get attached to a team, whether that be athletic or, or something else that, that's, you know, improved greatly because of the relationship that's established there. I mean, um, I can, uh, students always do better in the, the season. You know, we, we would always joke sometimes a football player does very well during football season is when they're not playing a sport, um, they would do worse and you would think it would go opposite but it's but it's almost never that way and whether that's ROTC or band or any activity a lot of high school in particular which is where I work um, is about connecting people to an activity and hopefully um, a group of support systems so we can improve that GPA um, that they may begin with well I, I think this is something that we we need to discuss um further I, I and i agree we, we should have uh, donna smith and the athletic director here when, when we do that discussion but i know that there are other school districts in our region that definitely have a higher standard um you know i i personally would like to see something that reflects more what the ncaa requires in order for an athlete to be competing as a freshman in college and um you know it, it needs to be something that's that's not stark at the very first year when you're a freshman because you know, sometimes it, you just start out right. behind and you need some time to catch up. But I think that the 
standards need to point you in that direction. Um, I, I also don't sorry. think that it will affect many students because it's my understanding that overall our student athletes have a higher GPA than the student body as a whole. That's true. I was, I was just going to say before, I know Mr. Tyson, the athletic director, and Donna have done some of the, the groundwork on there and can point. I think they've even looked at how many students participated in those semesters, so I know they can give you some information there, which is specifically what you're looking for because they've worked on that um, since Brian came on as the athletic director. Uh, Mr. Harrison, do you have any comments on the GPA part? We're going to – no, Rob? Okay, Carolyn, you can go ahead. I know you had a couple comments. Uh, well, what I was saying, was going to mention, I know that Donna and um, I think the uh, um, someone else had done some research on that, and we may want to have them come forth because I know some citizens and some people had asked about that because they were concerned with, I know some teachers uh, wanting to see us possibly look at maybe changing that raising at least to a C. Uh, and I know looking at item number six on four of seven, it says interscholastic inter athletes should be in, uh, in accordance with rules and regulations set forth by the North Carolina Department of Public Instruction and the North Carolina High School Athletic Association and the Cabarrus County Board of Education. Now, that's... Uh, you know, and I know their standards, we're just at their standards right now. So this may be something that we want to look at, but I know this has been brought up by some individuals, and I know some research has been done on it. Now, if it is something that this board wants to act on, we could get Donna to bring forth this recommendation. And I was told that we could not go below the standard. What we could do is go above it, but we could not go below it. Now, that's what I've been told. And I'm sure they would be more than happy to bring that forth to the board. And I think they've done some talking to some of the coaches and everything. So this might be something we won't discuss at another meeting. Mr. Shoemaker, you got a comment? No. 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 Okay. Um, well, the one I was going to make one comment on that, if I'm not mistaken, a, a, the coach of the individual sport can set a higher GPA than the minimum if they so choose. And then that way um, – if, if for some reason they just feel like they want to have a higher standard for their sport, is that is that correct? That's right. Uh, coaches usually have, you know, what since it is their extracurricular activity, coaches set the standard for their team. So they could do what you said. Some coaches say if you get suspended, you're automatically off the team. All that is kind of left up to individual coaches and schools. Some, you know, they they work together to make policies and and say here's how we want to you know, run our team and run our school's athletics. And, again, Brian and Donna can speak to that uh, more specifically. But, yes, everything you said is correct. But, uh, well, that may be something that we do want to discuss at a, at a future date. Um, um, perhaps because okay. this is just the first reading, right? Yes. So perhaps at the second reading we could, we could ask that uh, – Mr. Tyson and Ms. Smith be here so we can or have a Or the little... second reading and two. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, it, and, again, if you just indicate specifically what you want them to bring, mm -hmm. um, I know that they've done some work on there. I just don't have that in front of me. Then I can try to get them to do that. Well, I know one of the things that will come up, and, and, and you know, there are numerous, numerous people, and there's a couple of ADs that I see more than, than others, and they'll tell you that there's kids there that that's the motivation. That's why they get up and come, and that we will see a direct impact on the graduation rate. Do, do they – are they just telling me that, or do you hear that? Or No, I think, again, uh, they have specific numbers to say there were X amount of athletes in Cabarrus County. Here's the ones that would not have been eligible if, if you put in a, you know, a, a 2.0 or whatever it is that you would put in as a minimum requirement. So he can tell you um, by school, I think it was reported in for the district. And, and then, yeah, as we said before, I kind of gave that example, a lot of what you do with um, – with freshmen is try to get them attached to something in the school, especially students that may have not done well in the eighth grade or, or prior to that. And, you know, sometimes they don't have a great start. Um, and for some of those students, it would be very, very detrimental to, to eliminate that possibility of, again, improving. And, again, now there's arguments on both sides of this. But, um, yeah, there are certainly kids who are out playing sports that would not be able to do that. And... You know, some of them, that's the reason that they come. Again, they almost always do better during their season um, than they do off of their season, and, it, and that's usually because of those connections that they, you know, forge with 
teachers, coaches, um, instructors, and a lot of it is with extracurricular stuff like, again, ROTC, band, sports. Okay, so I, I guess if, if I'm hearing at least from two of our board members that they would like to have some further discussion on this. Uh, Mr. Harrison, you have a comment? As, as the uh, poor excuse for a liaison to the policy committee, um, it's kind of my understanding, correct me if I'm wrong, that um, if we're going to have a second reading of this policy, but we're discussing modifications or changes or, or uh, matters that pertain to the uh, policy as it's being presented here, should we not have a second uh, reading um, at a, f a future meeting until some of these other concerns are weighed out? And then bring the policy back again. Right. Be, uh, I, well, you see, gonna, but, but again, defer. I don't. But I'm not sure if I'm uh, speaking out of turn. I, I, I think, and, and maybe Mark needs to give us some direction. But, but in my opinion, I think what we're going to do is we've got an amended policy in front of us that has come from the policy committee that we're going to act on, or we're having a first reading and a second reading. But as part of the discussion of that change in policy, we're asking the policy committee to bring us information based on further discussion of the GPA and the impact it has on our athletes so that if we feel like in the in the future we need to make some sort of other adjustment that that's where we're going to we, we that's where we may or may not go but we're asking for that information and you can make a you can make an amendment to a policy on a second reading in other words it's presented here you can decide you have two choices you can you can do it here. Our, our, we do require two readings because the idea of the policy, uh, you should have a public opportunity to take action. So our board policy says you've got to have a first and second reading of all the policies. You could, you could adopt it and then decide to add an amendment if someone wanted to impose a grade restriction, uh, you know, minimum GPA for, athletic, for all athletic activities or certain athletic activities or a scale. Those would be possibilities you could do by amendment the second time around. And it sounds like you're asking staff to report back on statistics and maybe recommendations about why or why not to have that grading thing. The other option would be to defer consideration until you get that and then have two more readings. That does push it. That'll be another meeting down the road if you if you do that. But you could decide not to take, you could remove it from this list of first read, then you'd have a first read again where you discuss the amendment and a second read. So I, you could do it either way, but you don't have to. You can make a change between first and second, it's still valid. Okay. And I would only suggest that to, to be judicious and, and fair-minded about um, modifications to the policy that we take that second um, route that Mr. Enriquez is referring to. Um, and basically have two readings that's, that remain stable. Uh, that we have a first reading, make amendments to it, and the second reading is when we approve um, the policy as it stands as opposed to a first and then amendments and then um, a vote on the second. Am I clear? I guess what I'm saying is it seems uh, more efficient and more judicious for what policy is supposed to accomplish if we have stable policy on the second reading? I, I don't disagree with that. I guess it's in my opinion that we act on the policy that's in front of us and move to explore an additional policy or at a different time and, and ask staff to research, bring us the information, give a full presentation, if that's what this board wants to do. Um, you know, it sounds like now we're up to three. Um, and, and do act on what we have in front of us ten, tonight is the, the, the have the second reading August, but then move forward with that discussion and then it yeah, will I, come back to us I, I, I think that's that, that, that's a good good way to do it because as uh, Carolyn or somebody pointed out already it, it does already say in here that the the standards that the student athletes have to meet um, include those set by the Cabarrus County Board of Education. So we could have a separate policy that just says, here's, here's the standards for, um, you know, for, for us uh, over and above what the, the North Carolina requires. Uh, if the, yep. Is it the board's desire to look at grade point averages for athletes only, or is it the desire to look at all extracurricular activities, including clubs? and even down anything considered extracurricular. If that is the case, then I would want to bring more information to the board 
uh, concern. I mean, you're going to have Donna and Brian who are representing the athletic perspective and no one else. So I need to know how broad you want this discussion to become. Well, Carolyn, you, you kind of started the, the, the discussion, so we'll, we'll let everybody weigh in, but we'll start with you. When I was approached, they were looking at just the athletics is what I was asked about. Uh, it was happened to be two teachers, and they were they were just mentioning athletics is what they were they asked me about, and I told them I would look into it because they told me to check with the athletic association, and that was what I was asked to look into. So they told me athletics. Now I don't know how the rest of the board feels, and that's what I ask the end of you know our staff to look into what the athletic part was uh because they said that you know of course they had individuals in the class and uh and so that was what i was asked to look into was the athletic part uh, again we're not we're supposed to be educating children and that's what we should be concerned about uh, so that was what I was looking at was just the athletic part of it okay so Carolyn's athletics only Barry well I, I believe if this if the information has already been gathered on the athletic side we should we should hear that out and and that seems to be the the most uh, responsible route to go it's the research is done so you're not creating a lot of extra work but I think this board or at least personally, I would like to see what the impact is on other other groups to see if the extracurricular activities are making a difference in students' lives in their performance. I mean, they actually might be performing better because they do get involved, they're plugged in, and, and, they, and they have some peer pressure that f actually elevates their, their uh, educational or their desire to in increase their education. So not to try to force people to put through a bunch of put in a bunch of work right now dr shepherd but i think that would be again i guess i guess it goes to helping people understand our schools and and the results they're in and and other activities may be contributing to these to the good results that we see from a lot of the students and i would like to know that 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 is or see that that uh, evidence that that might be the case okay rob i'll tend to agree with barry David, I'd, I'd prefer not to um, seemingly or unfairly single out athletics and would advise a uh, broader um, extracurricular activities approach. Um, barring that, get to a point I to think uh, Mr. Shepard might have alluded to is that if we short term make a policy change focused just on athletics, have a longer term plan with the next number of months to get athletics and uh, extracurricular uh, acti activities um, aligned in policy. Is that okay. clear? Thank you. That's an all. <laughs> Jeff? I, I, at least initially, was only thinking of it in, in terms of athletics. I, I'm not sure I see a problem elsewhere. Let me make it clear what my motivation is for the athletics. I get the sense that there are some of our students who have God-given talent that makes them qualified to be scholarship athletes in college, but they cannot qualify to go to college because their grades are so lousy. And that is a shame. And I want to try to put into place a policy that will help that not to ha happen so that we can identify these students early on and say look three d's and an f it'll keep you eligible but it's not going to give you a life that you want and we we need to have a policy that pushes them to to maximize the use of their talents and to go on to college and get that scholarship okay thanks and that so that, that that's it all and, and my comment I, i'm i'm uncomfortable sing you know singling out athletics to say well you're going to have this, but everybody else is going to have something else. We may get data that says there's just a wide discrepancy, and it, you know, anything we bump is only going to impact athletics. I don't know. We we may not get that. We may, but to to only single one out, I'm a little uncomfortable with. So I guess for the as far as some of the information to come back to us, I, you know, and, and based on what everybody has, has has said here, I think it needs to be the the broader base uh, and not just 
not, not just athletics. So. Right, and can I, can I say just, um, and I want Mark's guidance on this, but I, I think the policy that's in front of you, if it moved forward, could be approved um, when school started and we could follow that. And I think what you guys are requesting is something that may would take some time. It also would probably not go in effect till maybe the following school year. So I would just, again, with Mark's guidance, say, these are things that I think we can move forward in, and then I will take to the next policy committee, discuss with, with Brian and Donna um, a new policy or an addition, however Mark would guide us to do that. Um, it just as far as timing of that, I think one can be we can follow this, and then this is probably going to be a, a longer-term um, decision before you would put it in place, I would think. That makes sense to me. In other words, I, I would agree. I think that's what Mr. Phillips was saying. You could, you could pass this and then bring a consideration of either an amendment to this or separate set of standards that says this is the standard and who it applies to. Both issues that I think will need some discussion at the policy committee level, input from staff, and ultimately the board will need to decide do we want some GPA standard and right. what activities is it going to apply to. But I think that is a, a second either amendment to this or a new policy that sets those out. Okay. Carolyn? Uh, yeah, and I don't want y'all to misunderstand. I wasn't trying to say <laughs> I'm after the athletics uh, because I'm not. I, I agree with – I'm kind of coming from the same area that uh, Jeff's coming from because, again, there's so many – individuals that are in the clubs and everything again this is great for the the individuals because again this helps with our graduation rate tremendously because it gets the children involved and that's what we want we want to do this and this is not something i'm trying to discourage at all because sometimes if those children were not involved we wouldn't see them graduate and i'm not trying to discourage that at all but again I think we're seeing a lot of these athletes, and again, I, I'm afraid that we're seeing some of them, they're not doing their potential, and they're just squeaky mind. These are the teachers that called me, and they were the ones that were, were, were concerned, and they wanted to see these individuals. They knew that they had higher potentials that they were not achieving. And so this is where my concern were. Okay, thanks, And so I, I'm okay with doing it all. I okay. mean, I'm, I have no problem with that. And David, do you have a comment? And I'm sorry, and I mean this just as an anecdote. Um, long ago and far away when I was a college instructor, uh, I had one of our students. And that individual was uh, very involved in athletics, but was not qualified to be at a college campus. Make your own conclusions from that. Um, the need for this standard is serious and it should be given great consideration to set and, and hold students to a standard um, for the privilege of being in these activities um, because their purpose of being in school is the academic side. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Harrison. So as, as, as I survey the landscape here, we're going to leave 3620 on for the first reading. We're asking Dr. Louder to get with Brian and Donna and other um, whatever. Policy committee. But, yeah, okay, well, I was getting to that part, but whatever the other activities, whatever they fall under, to get to the policy committee to then pursue what, what, what's the impact of this to then be able to come back to us and have some sort of formal uh, uh, report that we can then potentially act upon the following school year? Because we, we would not be, I don't believe, we would not be able to change during the middle. It had to be a disaster. Okay, that, that, that's my gut feeling. Okay, okay. Does everybody, does everybody understand what we're doing? Okay, great. Sorry, I, I don't want to beat a dead horse, but there was, there was one paragraph in here on, Intramurals that's completely deleted. What, what's the motivation behind that? It was that? just, when we were in the policy committee, it was just, um, it it's really depends on the schedule of the school. It was it was pretty firm, and I mean, we could read it of saying, the principal will encourage intramural, intramurals. You'll try to make teams as small as possible. It was very specific on how to do intramurals, and everybody there said, look, intramurals are great. If the school can work that out, it's fine, but we don't, it, it, it's just not needed in the policy committee. Let's go ahead and take it out. Okay, moving on to 4150, student assignment. Mr. Shoemaker? I don't have any specific questions regarding what you added into the policy, which was pretty much at the very end from what I understood. But 
Mine is on record keeping and how you do your record management. Because in this, it says each school is responsible. And when you have uh, each school responsible, do they have a named person who has access to the... It says each school is responsible for, I'm not sure exactly. Each, we're ma maintaining security of the, um, the records. Uh, hold on. Let me get back up to where that was. Records to missing children. Records received. There it goes down here. Here it is. It's at the bottom. It's right before you get to D. Um, Section D, it says each school or principal or his, design, his or her designee shall be responsible for record man maintenance and access for educating school personnel about maintenance and access policies. All persons having access who are given access to, rec to records should receive training and information concerning, concerning confidentiality and maintenance, security of student records, and privacy rights. Barry, can you tell us? I can't find where you are. You're in 4700. Oh. I'm sorry. Wasn't that the next one we were No, 4150. So sorry. Well, hold that thought because we're coming to you. <laughs> we'll come up. Yeah. Anybody? Yeah, I've got 4150. Okay, go ahead, Rob. So sorry. Talk to me more about what is this transfer appeal team? What is what is that? And it, it, Don, that, that's coordinated through Donna Smith's office. But when someone wants to move schools they, or or appeal their school assignment, they do that through Donna's office, and she has a team of. You know, usually, there's a principal. It depends. Sometimes it depends on the scenario, or if it's a high school student, she may involve the high school director. I know I was involved with that sometimes. Of deciding, the parent is saying, "I need to go to a different school because of X." Um, it may be a curriculum problem. It may be a, a mental health problem. So she kind of convenes a, t a team there of you know non-interested parties to say, "Hey, when we look at this information, is this a?" You know, is this an appeal that we would grant? Do we agree that this is a an issue that somebody else wouldn't have, and that would be kind of the exceptions to the rule? I think that's what you're okay. talking. Okay, I mean, about. just reading through it, I wasn't sure exactly. It doesn't really kind of give that of what exactly that is. Sometimes it says designee. Sometimes it does is designee in parentheses. It's got the transfer appeal team. And I think again, I'm just giving an example off the top of my head, but I think that depends on we have a scenario, and a parent again may say, "Well, as a mental health issue, she'll pull together this group." If it's a high school curriculum issue, she may pull together this group. If it's a, you know, so it depends on, well, we just really need one person's opinion or we need two or three people. So it's almost a case-by-case -case basis of who would weigh in on that. Um, okay. That's my experience with it. So just for this policy, if we're saying designee, does that also mean the, trans the appeal team? In that section, yes. In section, okay. I mean, it's, it's been added to most of the other sections. I just, it just wasn't added to paragraph one. Under, under C. It could be, to the, it could be. Yes, we can add that as well. Okay, thank you. Anything else on um, 4150? Go ahead. Just a couple of nitpicks. So in G2A, <laughs> it says unsafe school choice transfers, but earlier on it, it, we had updated that to school-related, I mean safety-related school choice safety related school choice instead of unsafe and then at the very bottom where it talks about cross references it it mentions policy 4151 which we renamed safety related school choice rather than unsafe school yes that's correct so just make them consistent so yeah. what you're saying right yeah in fact in the section what was that seven uh, E7, you've got it in the body, it's just all wrong at the top. So it just, yeah, somebody can go through and wordsmith it. Right. Okay. All right. Well, we'll start with Mr. Shoemaker, 4700 student records. Thank you, my question. It was on section. Okay. Right before you get to uh, section D, and I read all that. To you, is that what it is? I can't see the uh, number on this. My question is: It sounds like it's the responsibility of each principal, but are there some overriding, not policies, but procedures that you have at the central level that say each principal will make sure that they have a list of people who who have the the keys, the locks, the access, 
because this is, you know, this is like quality systems extraordinary here because, you know, you're dealing with, and then we go back to the recent issue that we had at one of our schools where a receipt with a student's name got out into the community. And to me, that was a student record of an activity and how, how we protect records. And so I, I really want some, I don't know if there's real teeth in your procedures below this or how they're done, but that's where I really feel like we've got to make sure we have adequate protection. Yeah, Mr. Fail's office works to standardize some of that, to say this is what all the folders should have, and then every school, and you correct me if I'm wrong, has a registrar that ultimately is in charge of that, so they have a records room, those would be locked up, and then ultimately, if they pull that, they sign in and out of those. So, you know, again, it varies from high school, then it would to middle school, then it would to elementary school, but there is a, a procedure that they have that you, they try to standardize as much as possible to have a, an access way. Well, and, and back to controls, are you auditing to make sure that they're doing what they say they should be doing? Or you know, do you have a process where you can go back and verify and check their process and make sure they're following the procedures? I mean, I, you know, I'm getting into the world that I came from, and, and that's where I want to make sure that we have a process to protect ourselves. Well. So first of all, I totally support the idea of the audit process. Um, we began last year auditing their, the actual cumulative folders. So we began that audit last year, and as we move forward, we'll begin to add components of that. Right now, we have not built in the audit process for the checkout process that they are supposed to follow at the school, as well as having them in a locked um, space, room, closet, whatever that is, uh, records room. Um, but we'll continue to move in that direction as we continue to build um, the expectations we have for cumulative folders and student records. Yeah, obviously, you've never been through an ISO 2000 or that type of uh, process, but in the ISO process, there's a very, very um, described uh, process for handling quality records. These are what I would call your, your true quality records that you have to have. So, you know, I, can, I, I might have a book at home that I can give to you, but, you know, it, it just helps further define how you audit it, what you audit, what you look for to make sure that only the people who are supposed to have access to these files get those accesses and that, and that we, we check our principles and make sure that they are doing what they say they do. Yes, <laughs> that'd be nice to have, thank you. Okay, thank you Mr. Shoemaker. Sure. Anybody else on 4700? Just a point of clarification, when we're talking about student records, we're talking about hard copy paper records on a shelf in a closet locked. We're not talking about any kind of digitized or uh, imaged uh, electronic records per se, are we? I mean, except, except uh, uh, cursory name, rank, and serial number type of records might be electronic, but in, for the purposes of this, we're talking about hard copy folders cumulatively accumulated over I the believe 12 so. years. I haven't read Is that, that in its entirety, but yeah, I believe that's talking about what's what in terms of the state is defined as the student's record, mm -hmm. which in our county is the student's cumulative folder, which is kept in that locked records room. Again, the hard copy paper mm -hmm. stuff. We do combined. have controls, however, for our student information system that is controlled by user rights, mm -hmm. who has rights to whatever access levels that they get depending on their role in the system. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, we have the password um, that you have to change every 90 days, follows all those kinds of rules, and like we do for email and other types of things. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, Carolyn, you got a comment on oh, the Well, the only thing on 47, if we put the other ones on consent, I would just like 4,700 pull, pulled off and put on action because I, personally, y'all know, I didn't vote for 4,700 when we did it before. And I'm not going to vote for it now because I don't like the content. I don't. I do not like the content of what we've got listed under the directory stuff. Y'all, y'all know I did not vote for that before, you, and you I are, won't vote for you that. You are correct. Now. Well, it's and, not. We're not doing a consent. We're we're going to. These are action items. We're going to vote tonight. So I guess. When yeah, we're done, uh, all right. we're done with this. You can pull it off, and then we'll go from there. Okay. So, I hear you loud and clear. Okay, uh, um, 75 
to, oh, Matthew, you got another comment? Yeah, just one other quick comment, just because it's a wonderful opportunity that we are trying to move towards digitizing cumulative records and moving towards an electronic system for that. It did go through the budget process this year, although the, you know the budget's tight and didn't get approved. But I do want you to know that we fully support moving in that direction. I've been working with um, Sarah. Uh, through Mark's office about how to do that and with DPI trying to set in motion uh, the steps we would need to take in order for that to happen as we go towards the future. Right. Thank you, Matthew. Okay, 7510, leave. Maybe I should go to 8315 real fast before somebody has a comp. I'm kidding. <laughs> Rob, you need so, a sec. No, comp no more comp time. All right. <laughs> Yeah, essentially, comp time um, does not exist for hourly employees. Um, it is a legal option, but it's one that our district has chosen not to use. So if they work over and you're not going to pay overtime, then they would come in two hours later or whatever it would be. So that that's not an option um, in that area, and, and that's why it's removed. Okay, it just doesn't apply. This isn't a, doesn't apply to teachers, right? Right. It, it exempts staff or non-hourly okay. employees. It's a different, different issue. I don't have any issue. Okay. 7510, anybody? Anybody else? Anything? Okay. 8315, capital assets. What is the, the purpose of this? It says it's coming from the finance, not from the uh, state. It's the, uh, the capital asset threshold just determines when we put it on our general ledger versus when we put it on an inventory report. So at the point that it, it's large enough to depreciate, and we don't truly depreciate in, in our regular fund the way we would in, a, in an enterprise fund, but it goes on a separate list and we depreciate it over time. Most um, governments have moved to $5,000 quite some time ago. Uh, we just feel like it's time to, to uh, make that change. It goes from one list to another. So what what is it at right now? Is it two thousand? Oh, okay. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, go ahead, Barry. You have on here buildings at fifty years mm -hmm. depreciation. What does that What does that mean to us? If a building is depreciated over fifty years, and what does that mean that you're does, is that for insurance purposes? It means very little. Um, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> well, and, and the next the next piece of the question is why would you amortize a build? Why would you depreciate a building over a 50 year period? <laughs> well, we have we have to put it on our books as an asset, and right. you want to see the asset list, and so with that comes a, a schedule of its life, and we assume based on on general. Um, other school systems and, and practices like school systems that our buildings should last 50 years and that's just a good rule of thumb. So in, in business it's a whole lot different in that that goes against your, your bottom line, your profit, but it, does, it has absolutely nothing to do with our profit or our dollars. It just sits on a schedule and, and it becomes depreciated over 50 years or whatever those years are generated there. Well, only reason, I, for instance, we do the J.M. Robinson Field House. Mm -hmm. So that building would be on a 50-year depreciation schedule. It's an addition. Um, is additions the same? Even though it's standalone? The improvements. improvements. It would be a building improvements 25. That would go to, as a building improvement, even though it's a separate standalone structure. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's clear as mud for me. Thank you. <laughs> Got it. Uh, Mr. Harrison. We earlier talked about the uh, arrangement we were making with um, the city of Concord concerning the Glenn Center. Mm -hmm. Here we dis we're discussing capital assets. Mm -hmm. Don't let me mix apples and oranges, but is this policy in alignment with the agreement that we are about to make with um, City of Concord, or, or is it completely un, unrelated? It, it would not. It would not be related in the sale of the asset. That's not what we're discussing here. What we're discussing is when we put it on our books and when we remove it, and, and over what period of time we move it, remove it from the general ledger, which again doesn't impact your your bottom line or your financials in any way. It's just a it's a picture of what the school system owns 
and re is responsible mm -hmm. for. But yeah, we're discussing started. removing the the Glenn Center property from our books. Mm -hmm. And we would. Uh, I assume that at this point it's probably fully depreciated. And um, therefore, is that depreciation in conformance with this policy? It was in conformance with the policy we had prior to this policy. Um, and so if we adopt this policy, which I believe it was the same, the same structure, um, we would then put land on from now on um, at, at this 20-year mark and depreciate it over 20 years. I assume that when we, we acquired that land, it was 20 years, um, but I wasn't around then, so I'm not positive. Um, and so it, it should be the same. Okay. We would just be removing it. This point. Okay. Anything else for 8315? Just a quick comment. Kelly, I guess this, Kelly Probst, I guess this, Dr. Probst, it will make your job much easier that the computer equipment has been raised to $5,000, won't mm -hmm. it? It won't. She still has to keep track of them. We don't want them to walk. It's a, it's a separate inventory list. But, than... but that will be a different inventory list. It is, but it's tedious. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't make her job easier. <laughs> <laughs> okay, board members, we've got uh, six policies on first reading that I, I need to entertain a motion to adopt on first reading. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I would make a motion that we adopt policy 3120, 3620, 4150, 7510, and 8315 on first reading. Okay, we have a motion on the floor to adopt the uh, five policies as stated by Ms. Carpenter. Do I have a second? second? I have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, Ms. Monroe, that carries 6-0. Uh, I now need a motion, or I guess we can have further discussion on uh, Student records. Um, well, somebody well, else can make a motion on that, and I'll just do my vote on 4,700. Well, I, uh, okay. Just turn off. Oh, sorry, sorry. I, I will make a motion that we uh, pass policy 4,700 as presented. Okay, second. I have a motion and a second. second. Okay, I, I guess I, I'd want to make some minor comment so maybe I should have done this before the motion and the, the second but I just Carol I, I know you voted no last time and I just want you to remember when we sat on stage at graduation and you had a program with everybody's name on it and their academic achievements that list only gets put together by the principal or somebody at that school going out and getting every single person's permission to make that list if we don't have a policy to define what directory information is and a playbill the program at the football stadium, all of that, I, you know, it just, I, 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 I understand the sensitivity of information and data gathering, especially in light of what's been going on in the news, but I just want to make sure that, that I, 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 I don't know why I want to make sure you know that, because I think I, you probably I do. I know that, but I just do not like, oh, excuse me. Uh, and, and I, well, these guys that are new on here. And let me explain. And and our attorney can tell you that uh, that I know what I'm talking about <laughs> because we had quite a bit of discussion on this. It is up to this board. We can decide what we put in the student record part of this policy. We decide what goes into that part. It is up to us. We can decide what information when you look on this policy that we're refer referring to the 4700 uh when you look under that student record uh policy part where it's got student record all that information that's listed under there when we we look under there when you see that and what and, and Blake, you know, where it says student's full name, photo, date of attendance, grade level, and picture. Anyway, under each of those categories, we decided, or this board voted, I didn't vote for this, what each of those things were. Now, it's up to us. We can decide what goes in those that FD. We voted on what was going to be in that. 
and I don't like that much information. Uh, and as Blake was mentioning, that some of this, they felt they needed all this stuff, like for the photo and the, uh, the you know, the address and all this type stuff. See, I would, I don't like that much information floating around like that on our children. And this is where I'm coming from. And that's why I say no on this. Uh, you know, to me, it, it, it's too much information. Uh, and that's why I'm voting no on this. Now, this okay. is just me personally. Well, and I wanted to give you the opportunity to tell us why, why you were. And, and the point I was trying to make is we do have an opt-out. If you don't want to be a part of it, you can opt out. But the, to, the burden of putting a lot of the things that we do together would be, would be enormous. And it's not, we're not broadcasting this out. Again, directory information is just we're using it as a term to define what we're calling directory information. And that's what it is in case a college recruiter calls the school, a military recruiter calls the school, or for some other reason, there is a list of specifically well-defined information that we're giving out. So with that being said, um, we have a motion and a second, but we well. We I just want to make one there's one there's discussion. one comment in here, in the release of directory information. It says provided the parent or eligible student has been given proper notice and an opportunity to opt out. So there's an opt out clause, which gives every mom and dad out there the opportunity not to have their children's directory information. So we have it by exception rather than trying to rule it by detail let them if, if there's anything they disagree with then they have the option and the opportunity to opt out and, and, and I, if I remember correctly during that time the board directed administration to move that section within the handbook to the to a more prominent place and we did follow that direction so I I believe we would need to um, you know to remember that we are in the opt-out opportunity we've made parents more aware of that uh, since the board voted on this last time. That is correct. That's a good point. Have, have, have there been um, more than just a handful of students, parents who have a, uh, opted out of release? As far as what I know, a very, very small group. Again, some of the people that deal with records may speak more specifically, but very, very small because most of the time they want to participate in, in all the activities that Mr. Kiger was, was talking about that usually is a benefit to the student. Okay, we have a motion and a second. So all those in favor of the, the motion say aye. 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 Any opposed? No. Okay, Ms. Monroe, that motion carries five to one. Okay, thank you, Chris. Um, let's see, we're now at 7.3, and we'll go ask Mr. Whitkey back up to the podium for a Culture and Web update, Kitchen Hood Replacement Project. You should have before you a... Okay. A bit tabulation form. Um, the reason this was in originally, we were talking about QSCB, and and we had this on on the um, agenda for approval, because this is now, if, if you all agree to approve the budget request, budget modification request, um, it becomes a bit of a mute point because this then becomes an operating budget uh, process. Uh, but I just, it, in showing this to you, just wanted to share that uh, RNL sheet metal was a little bitter. Uh, we, we combined, uh, he, 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 the reason he pointed out or separated his bid was uh, there was a change in the code, as I mentioned, we are now required to provide um, tempered air to feed the hoods. And he just wanted to point out what that cost was to us. But his combined bid of 58958 was low. And I went back and I looked at uh, what we ultimately had spent on the other three uh, hood projects and this is right in line with those even at the with the additional cost uh, for the treated air so um, I feel you know we, we're getting a good price and uh, it was a good bid so with that recommendation I'm just open it up to any questions okay um, any any questions and, and again we this is an action item so we're going to take take motions and, and vote on the acceptance of this the low bid unless anybody has any questions okay I just just curious. I, I, have have we done work with 
RNL before? Yeah, we've done quite a bit with them, and oddly enough, they've been the low bidder on all three other hood replacements. So they're very knowledgeable about our needs. Okay. All right. Do I have a motion to accept uh, the, the low bid of RNL sheet metal for the kitchen hood replacement at Colchin Web? So moved. Second. Do I have a motion and a second? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, that carries six to zero. Thank you. And we will move to 7.5, the budget request that we will revisit from, from Ms. Klutz from previous. I'm sorry, 7. Point, I turned my page too much. Yes, 7.4, I'm sorry, I turned my page. <laughs> no, this, no, but it's, it's one and the same. Um, this is the uh, bid tab for the project bid uh, the uh, boiler project replacement at Mount Pleasant High School. And the, um, as you can see, we received three bids. Um, the low bidder is uh, Facilitech. Again, uh, they are a, a firm that we've worked with in the past. They do a lot of maintenance type uh, project work for us uh, when we bid that. And uh, their number is the number uh, we, we took, and, and I apologize, We I know there was a request um, in last month's uh, meeting to have the alternates explained on on the form uh, we we got to the consultant too late so we got this so at least we were able if you go one more page down i believe kelly okay then then hit another it's a separate document there is an explanation that the uh, third alternate uh, well all, all three of them are explained uh the first alternate is the um uh, addition of the joint uh, oil and gas burning uh, burners rather for the for the uh, devices there's no ad for that uh, specifically that's included in the base bid uh, the alternate for uh, going with the well wheel McLean boilers in lieu of the specified base bid boilers uh, that's something we we would like to see uh, we have quite a few of those uh, the wheel McLean boilers uh, that we have in other schools and there's no additional cost to that and then finally the third item is a replacement of the um, boiler stack going through the building to, through the roof uh, there's been debate uh, at the time that the bid was sent out there was some belief that the original stack uh, may have included uh, some asbestos lining uh, on the outside of the stack we have since um, found that that's not the case. We checked with the manufacturer of that stack and that, that is not the case. But because of its age, uh, we still may want to replace it. So we're asking for approval of that to allow us to have the money in place to spend in case once we get into that area of the, of the construction and we can expect in, inspect the stack by a boiler, man, you know, boiler representative, we'll verify whether or not that does in fact have to take place. If not, we won't spend the money, of course, but if it is needed, then we'll be in a position to be able to do that. Any questions? Okay. Thank you, Lynn. Any, any questions? No? I'm just, I'm just going to say thank you. I'd like to, I like this bid format. It's very easy to follow and understand. I know you couldn't get it all on one page, but it's a whole lot easier for us to figure out what's going on on these things and had been in the previous. So if you I, keep I it in a similar format, I'd appreciate it. Thank absolutely. you. Absolutely. You're welcome. Okay, um, I, Jeff, go ahead. I, I notice you have um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven requests, I guess, went out, and, and four of them, no bid. Did it, was there any pattern, and did they give you any feedback as to why they didn't um, buy the bid? This, this was a, a, a bit of a strange one because um, the, we had been um, asking for mandatory uh, pre-bid um, attendance uh, what we were getting <laughs> from many of these people was that in some cases they were outside the area some cases they just were flat out busy they, they couldn't make it and so sort of in midstream we ex we removed that requirement expecting more bidders we went there and one person showed up the other two had already been there the previous week so we we said okay because we we removed that requirement we'll therefore accept bids from anyone who has has seen it in the previous pre-bid because we, we rebid this the first time it, it came in way way high so we rebid the work and we had one group of bidders from the first time uh, which we didn't get three bidders that was the other thing we, we only had 
two bidders, uh, and the one withdrew. So we had one bidder from the first time, another two people uh, that chose to bid this time. So it, it's really strange right now. Uh, this again, uh, some of the bidders simply said, we don't like uh, the federal requirements and we don't like bidding those projects, too much paperwork. Uh, we did get that from a couple of them. So it, it's, um, I think, as I said, times are changing. Work is becoming a bit more uh, uh, available. And so some of these folks, especially the larger ones, uh, th this is really a small job for them. And they're, we just couldn't generate a lot of interest. OK, board members, uh, any other questions on the boiler at Mount Pleasant High School? OK, I need a motion. That the board approve the. <laughs> Hang on one sec. Um, it, it's thrown me a little bit that it says the apparent low bidder here, but we know it's. Is there any particular reason that word? Okay. No. And, and then I realized I'm not sure if I need to read the whole thing since it has numbers, but we didn't do that previously, so we're going to do it like we did before. <laughs> Um, I need a motion in a second that the board award a construction contract for the boiler replacement to facilitate the, the low bidder along with accepting alternates number one and number two at no additional cost. So moved. Okay, we have a motion second. and a second. All those, did I get that motion correct, Mark? You did, although I think I heard Mr. Wiki say you uh, on option three, he was asking for approval. I don't see that in the written motion in your materials, but I think I heard him say that they wanted you to approve okay. alternate three in case when they get in there they see that. So, okay. Yes, Thank that, you. Yes, that's yes, he did, and I was concentrating so hard on how I was going to phrase the motion, I missed that. So <laughs> thanks for, for picking that up. So we, we need a motion to accept the contract uh, or the, the, the bid from Facilitech as the low bidder along with alternates number one and two at no additional, or one, numbers one and two and three. How about we just leave it at that? So move. <laughs> so move. I have a motion. Do I have a second? Sorry, the yeah. The, the thumb. The Former thumb. motion. <laughs> uh, I have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. I have a motion and a second. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that carries six to zero. Thank you very much. Great, thank you. Okay, now we'll go to 7.5 and have Ms. Kelly Klutz come to the podium. Yay! Thank you. <laughs> meeting's almost over. So this um, request to move funds is the one that we've talked about um, so that we could continue with the uh, Jay and Freeze roofing project. It will take $114,000 out of the, the um, Northwest Boger Athletic Fields and it will put it into the freeze uh, roofing project. So, and then the, the next one, is so that we can um, continue with the Mount Pleasant High boiler project that we just discussed. We'll be removing $46,500 $46, from the kitchen hoods and $40,000 from the breaker panels um, to make that project work. And we will um, take and uh, pay for the kitchen hoods from other funding sources. Okay, board members, we've talked about this previously, uh, so unless there's, uh, you, you've got another comment to make? Just to, uh, in a perfect world, when can we put the money back into the uh, uh, Boger Northwest um, needs? And uh, again, uh, I know why we're doing this now, but when can we possibly address the needs uh, that previously were earmarked for Boger and for Northwest? That should go back on our capital outlay list or our facilities list that's greater than uh, less than two hundred thousand dollars. There's either depending on what that amount ends up being. If it is the the lesser that we've ended up with, it would go on that facilities project. And list. that's still under review by the county. Uh, we have selected the projects that we will do. We have approximately a million dollars within that budget that's that's ongoing. Um, so those have been selected. Those were the highest uh, level of needs. Those were selected in budget committee and then presented to you as a proposed budget. Um, so yes, those have been completed. But are we saying that five months, six months from now, we, we can have monies allocated 
I don't think she, she, she's not putting a timetable on it. There, there's not an amount that's specifically now earmarked for that project. And I'm not expecting additional well, revenue coming in anytime soon, but if we do, certainly that could be added to the list. But those have already been prioritized is mm -hmm. partly what you're saying. The most severe only. Um, we did not go beyond, so level zeros mm -hmm. and level zero zeros were prioritized, um, but anything beyond that were not. Okay. I, I was just, just germane to, to what you just asked. It, the, the other caveat here is that, that doing it for 140 some odd thousand was contingent on the National Guard doing most of the work, and they can't do it because their budget's been cut by the sequestration. So, okay. Okay, so until the federal budget issues are resolved, then that option's on hold. And so if we wanted to do it all ourselves, it's 600000 ish was the original budget. Yeah. So the, we're being prudent to use the funds uh, how we can, mm -hmm. given the uh, partnership uh, can't be activated at the moment with the National Guard. And okay. keep in mind Thank they you. expire. So if we set, held them to try to decide if we were going to be able to do it later, you know, the clock's ticking and, and it's not going to be resolved between now and August, uh, April 1st. Ms. Klutz, you do good work. Thank, Thank you, you, sir. Okay. <laughs> Can I have a motion to um, accept the budget request that Mrs. Klutz has presented? I'll S go ahead. So moved. I'll second it. I have a motion and a second. All those in favor? No, I no. And, and we're, we're, we're trying not to use the thumbs up. So I have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that passes six to zero. Okay, we will move on to 7.6 and we'll keep Ms. Klutz at the podium for our SRO contract for the city of Concord. Yes, thank you. Um, our SROs, we have SROs in uh, high schools and middle schools. There are two separate contracts, um, and it, it's, not it's not funding source that's, dri that's driving those two contracts. Um, it is location of the school, whether they're city or county and, and uh, sheriff's office or, or city police officers. So the um, city contract is renewable every year. The county contract is a five-year contract, so you do not see the county contract before you. We approved it last year, and it's a, there's a five-year um, lifespan on that. So the only thing that's before you today is the city contract, uh, and the only change to the contract was an increase in um, salary and benefits for the police officers, so that is passed on to us. Um, it's approximately $7,000, if I recall accurately. Um, and th this is funded uh, with our at-risk funds, remediation funds, is how we pay for this, and so we will be able to absorb that, um, that increase fairly comfortably. Great. Thank you. Questions? Any questions or concerns or comments on the SRO uh, contract? Mr. <coughs> Mr. Vice Chair, as a City of Concord employee, I'd like to abstain from this vote. Absolutely. Thank you, Mr. Walter, for reminding me of that. So. Uh, uh, you're welcome to comment, I guess, but just not to vote. Or and, and under our, um, since this is an actual action item, our conflict rules require the rest of the board to approve the waiver. So I've talked to Mr. Walter. I do think to avoid any appearance of impropriety, since it's a contract with the city, it makes sense to excuse him. But actually, the, the, you should vote on that to approve so that he is not participating in the vote. Okay, so I need a motion to uh, for the board to approve for Rob to abstain from voting on the City of Concord's contract. Mr. Chair, I'll make a motion that we uh, honor Mr. Walter's abstention from this vote. Okay, we have a, uh, a motion. I'll and, second it. And, and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, hearing none, we'll move on. Um, do I have a motion to accept the City of Concord's I, contract for the SR? I have one question. Oh, okay, go ahead. Obviously, with the Cabarrus County, we have a five-year contract, but with the City of Concord, a yearly renewable contract, why don't we have a five-year contract, or are they unwilling to enter into one of those? Because this seems a little redundant. 
Um, we, I don't know that we've actually ever asked the City of Concord to do a five-year, but my guess, um, the answer that I believe that I would get, is that there's an annual review of salary, and it, the, the contract would have to be elevated to ensure that they had enough for a five-year possible increase in salary. So I, I believe we would be paying more on a yearly basis if we attempted to get a five-year contract. Now we pay actual. But they would be required to, to budget in the difference in the contract. So how does the contract with the county work then? They pay for it. They pay for those increases. Who pays? The county does. Okay, we have so, a so we're, we get a lump sum contract amount for a five-year period for X number of officers. Mm -hmm. And then if there's COLAs or anything in that period of time, then they, they just eat that in the contract. Mm -hmm. So we may be paying additional monies to protect them on the upside with that contract as well. Or do you go into year one saying, here's what the cost of an officer is in the Cabarrus County contract. And so that's what we pay for those officers for that year and five years on down. We do, we do not eat additional costs with the county contract. The amount of the, the salary that we pay is less than what a lot of the officers make. They do us a service. Okay, that's good. Thank you. And just, I mean, because the discussion was, um, you know, the county, obviously we get our funding from the county, mm -hmm. and so there was not really a concern of negotiating how much was going to get paid back. So, I mean, I think we were able to do a five-year because they're essentially funding the schools to fund their officers. Not quite the same situation, though, with the city because you've got the different revenue pots, which is why I think we we're on a one-year instead of a five. I, one question I have, have we seen, I, I know there had been talk possibly of some, possibly some grants and things possibly coming with public safety. Have we heard if any money's become available with school safety or anything at the state or federal level to possibly fund some additional SROs? Mm -hmm. There was a grant uh, mentioned in, in, I believe it was the House version, is that correct? Um, there is one, I'll have to go back and, and tell you which version it's in, um, I believe it's the House version, and it's a matching grant. So if you, if you put an SRO in locally, then the, uh, the state would match it. Um, it. Of course, I don't know all the, the regulations and guidelines, and, and we don't even have a budget yet, so, but that was, um, a, that was in there. Okay. All right. Uh, I, I'd make a motion that we approve this. Uh, uh, the uh, uh, it, this one is the city, the, right? Correct. The SRO contract with the For city, of city, Concord. city of Concord. Okay. I have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. I have a motion and a second. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. The motion carries six to zero. It's five. I'm sorry, five to zero. Yes. Thanks for the correction. Moving on, 7.7. 7. It cost you a thing. <laughs> for the approval for training hours to be submitted to the NCSB for Carolyn Carpenter. I don't know if we had. I was just going to say, I, I uh, make the motion. Okay, I have and a motion. I second and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that motion carries six to zero. And now we'll move on to what we added to our agenda of 7.8, Carolyn's request to add a resolution from our board asking that uh, the legislature or our, our Senate delegate to the legislature added to a piece of legislation changing the calendar for the filing period for school board elections. Do I have that right? Yeah. Uh, what if, what I would like to do is for uh, our board to do a resolution to change the filing date from February, which is where it's at now, back to July, uh, which it had been for years and years. Uh, we our, The school board would file in July, uh, and I'd like to see us put it back to uh, the time frame it used to be. Uh, nine months from the time of filing, uh, to, is, is an awful lo a long time, um, and, and it's too long of time. Uh, last election, we actually had uh, two candidates, or maybe three, that actually dropped out 
uh, from from that date because a lot of different things changed because uh, you actually have from February to when November that's almost 10 months and you know a lot of things can change uh, during that time uh, if the date would be put in July there would be no additional cost to the taxpayers because basically in July there uh, is also the uh, soil and water conservation uh, that has to file during that time so there's no additional cost that would be incurred because there is someone else that would file at that time uh, we would like this to be effective in the 2014 election uh, I did talk to our uh, Senator Hartzell this afternoon and he said if we could get uh, if the board would vote on this and could get an uh, email to him uh, with a resolution or something that the board had voted uh, to him and our delegation uh, that they would try to get something uh, possibly put tacked onto a bill uh, something you know tacked on to something it wouldn't be an individual bill but they would work and try to get something done uh, but basically like I say it used to be like this um, there um, and then too uh, we um, um, I know that uh, uh, some people had talked some of our board members had talked maybe later on looking to see about possibly seeing about the rate change but that would be something that we could look at the fee but um, I think that we need to do a resolution and send it to Fletcher Linda Larry and a representative forward <coughs> uh, so if we can get that passed I would like to see that and so I would put it in a form for us to do a resolution and get you to sign it and uh, uh, to change it back to the original date like we used to have it and uh, uh, and get a resolution to that effect to make it in July and make it effective for the 2014 election okay so it's only been one election cycle that was all no, we've had it too it's been two I, I think the 2010 cycle was July no, no maybe it was two. so it's been two cycles it's been okay two cycles we've had well um, Board members, any dis discussion? I have a question for Mark, but we'll have some discussion first. Uh, good idea, although it seems like we usually beat things up pretty for a long time, and then we get a motion and, and, and go from there. So um, let, let's. Okay, I have a motion and a second, and now we'll open the floor for d discussion. And I, I suppose, let me ask my question of Mark before we get on. To, to have a resolution, we need to actually physically have a written resolution. I, I would imagine that we're we're voting on. Do we need to? Would it require somebody to write something before we actually vote can on we it? We just do an email that say that we have voted on this and would like for him to do it. I mean, I think you can you can um, do verbal or oral resolution. So I think if you have, it depends on how the motion, I guess, is, is worded. You don't, I mean, you're right. Technically you don't have a written out resolution, but you could, if Carolyn's motion is that you resolve that you want to, you know, seek special legislation changing uh, the filing date to July. Is there I a particular? Back just like it was mm -hmm. two years ago when we, exactly right. like it was before in July and filing when the soil right. and water conservation files so it's putting it back just like it was okay I tell you what if we could do this if you if if, if, if you can pull what you read and said before so we can discuss it and then have you along with Mark sort of wordsmith whatever it is we're going to vote on I think I'd feel a little more comfortable about that but we as it now stands we have a motion and a second on the floor would you would you do the pleasure of the chair of pulling that motion off the table for, so we can then discuss it further so that so that we can have a a conversation of exactly what we're what the words, what the words are going to be that somebody's going to want to send to to senator hartzell and you've listed about four other people and and okay and, and, and I, I guess does that make sense what I'm asking you okay
let, let's let's go down the line and 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 we'll start with Mr. Shoemaker. Do you have any comments that you'd like to make on on what Carolyn is asking us to do? You're in favor of what? Okay, Rob, do you have a comment? Um, you know, what was the background and it was it was this board that changed it in the first place? Is that right? Not, no, it wasn't this yeah, board? Yeah. Oh, it, it wasn't the, the it wasn't the previous one. I was not on the board when the date changed, so it was previous to that. So do we know why or what? Was it, I thought it was actually the board of elections that changed the. Well, it was us, it was our board that changed it to February. Yes, it, it goes. Okay. Long, it, it I, I don't I don't know the whole history. Said, originally, it was said. Oh, you're going to be able to get more exposure. You're going to be able to get, uh, you know, you'll be able to get more time between elections. They're going to get, you're going to get, be able to get so much, you know, they're going to interview you. You're going to get, it was a bunch of bull. It, it didn't happen. It wasn't what it was cut out to be. I'm not going to go into all, it, it, it didn't. You know, they said, oh, well, Pete, they'll come and you'll get, oh, They said, you'll get to, they're going to interview you. You'll get to have more time for, uh, you know, go to forums and all this type thing. That was the way it was laid out. That didn't happen. Uh, Carolyn, yeah. hold, hold that thought. We need to, oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, uh, they said, you know, if you file in February, you'll get to go to all these forums and everything. Now, all of us sitting on this board knows that didn't happen. Uh, you know, when we filed in February, everybody forgot about us till probably uh, July, maybe August. Then they notified you and knocked on your door and said, hey, we want to do an interview with you. That didn't happen. But that was the way it was sold to us that that was what was going to happen. Uh-uh, that didn't happen. One of the problems with you filing in February, you've got to compete with county commissioners, judges, uh, everybody else, and then everybody forgets about you. It's better to be filing in July. You don't have to wait so long. And two, not much is happening in July, so you're going to get some, some, some time to yourself. And again, soil and water is filing, so there's no additional cost to the Board of Elections for that to happen. Okay, Rob, you, you, you've got this. Okay. Is your I, I mean, my, my, my point, or at least from my personal experience, it was a little confusing to have it in February, um, but it did give a couple opportunities to present. But most of the activity that we did, or at least mine did personally, was all in the summertime. So I don't, I don't have any objection necessarily. To, I think you know, July was fine. I do think that somebody should have a stake or more of an interest if they're going to apply for, or want, want to be on this board than more than just $5 to get your name on a, on a on a ballot. So I do think we ought to consider or think about, you know, what exactly do we want someone um, <clears throat> really do, not, not qualifications, but basically having more stake in the game to, to be on <clears throat> to be on the ballot. So those are my, my, my thoughts for it, but I'm okay with July. Okay, David. I'm okay with July. Um, I'd like to raise the possibility that we could just recycle the previous motion, I'm sorry, the previous resolution from a few years ago with these modifications and in effect not have to rewrite the whole thing from scratch. Um, it's there, it worked to undo things a few years ago, take the same one, revise it as we're asking to do so now and, and uh, expedite and facilitate the uh, request to the state legislators and uh, our representatives uh, in Raleigh. Um, filing in July will produce the best and I think the most sincere, um, foresightful, and um, best quality candidates for this school board. My general impression of uh, having watched the uh, and, and having participated in the election cycles over the years thank you okay Jeff you have any comments you want to make well I think filing in February led to uh, very One insightful eight. candidates <laughs> I know oh, four four exceptions <laughs> 
All right. That's okay. That's okay. As, as the engineer on this board, I've spent the time while you were discussing writing a proposed text. Yes. The Cabarrus County Board of Education hereby resolves that it requests the North Carolina General Assembly to, oops, left that out, to pass special legislation to set the filing date for Board of education candidates to the month of July in years that a Board of Education election is held. The filing dates should be identical to those of the Cabarrus County Soil and Water Conservation Board. And I guess I should add, insert Cabarrus County Board of Education where I just said Board of Education. E effective for the 2015. Yeah, 14, 14. E 14. Effective for the 2014 elections okay that's okay. it do you have any other comments no okay uh well i'll i'll, I'll make mine i i guess it, it there's a couple things that i'm a little uneasy about the actual filing is not not as one that i'm, I'm way uneasy with I'm a little uneasy that our chairman is not here, so we're doing this as a six-member board instead of a seven-member board. I'm a little uneasy. I don't know, since I've gotten here, if we've ever had something that came up the day of a meeting that we voted on and then approved and then sent down and, and, and took care of it without going from, you know, a um, business, uh, a work session to a business meeting, I mean, all in the same day of something, you know, this agenda we've had for several days. That we haven't had, and that that that's bothersome to me as well. And then the reality is, I you know I guess the 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 political reality is that anybody that runs in the primary and loses can turn around and file and run for school board, and we sort of get the consol we're the consolation prize. And 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 in my opinion, you know again I started off saying eh, it doesn't bother me a great deal, but at the end of the day. I'd rather have people running for this seat that want this seat specifically and not as, well, that didn't work out and I can turn around and just run again. And, and so I'm, I'm, I'm just a little uneasy that anything that has to be done that quickly, I typically shy away from. I do that in my business world. I do that in my, my personal life. If we want to put this on for August and have a discussion for a month, it's going to hit the newspaper that we talked about it, and I think we're going to hear one way or the other what, what people think about it. Then, then to me, that's the proper way that this board typically does, does uh, business and handles our, handles our affairs. And let me tell you, the only reason is because of the way the legislation is and to get it where we can do it in the 2014 year. It, that we could not do a regular bill, and it was not until this afternoon when I did talk with our senator and to get it in this session, see if it was done next year, it would not be it would not be able to be on the the twenty fourteen year. You couldn't get it in to the session next year for this to happen. And again, that's why I brought it up at our last meeting to check. And again, I was doing the check and to find out. And as and uh, as Lynn said last one, he said, well, go ahead and check. He thought it was too late. And I did not find out until this afternoon. I did try to contact our chair by mobile phone, was not able to contact him, but I did try to reach him as soon as I found out, which I did not find out until the... 15 to 5 this afternoon or I would have you know did something earlier but to make this happen this is why it is set short notice sometimes things cannot be helped with that and you, if you wait until then the legislation legislators will probably be out of session and it could not go into effect what is the and forgive me for not knowing this but what is the legislation legislature's schedule as soon as the budget's passed they're gone <laughs> and that could be well, tomorrow it could be and and this is going to be tacked on to something so it it could be any time 
They'll still be passing bills all through the through the fall, will they not? No, as soon as no, they, they get go, through, they're go gone. Reconvene in January. January, and that's why I'm oh, saying yeah. they said they would. And this may not even happen though. Now this, he said, send it, and I'm not saying it could happen. He said if we got this passed, we could send, and they could try. I'm not guaranteeing this will happen. He said just send this, and they will try. I'm not guaranteeing that it will happen, and he didn't guarantee it. He well, said, "Get this." You can guarantee it. Can we get you down there on the budget talks? That's what we need. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, and don't worry, guys. I did even put that in when I did talk to. Him. I said, "You can send us some money." He says, "Carpenter, you haven't changed, have you?" I said, "No, I'm always going to ask for money." Okay. Uh, so well, I did I, ask I, for I that. I promised you an opportunity to read. State your motion, and I, I'm, I'm going to grant you Well, that. I, I like I just want his. to make sure that we've discussed I, everything that we want to discuss. I think before. that you make a good point, Mr. Geiger, that this is not necessarily an emergency situation, and it would be a better opportunity for us to see what well, the public— Well, it won't happen. What, I mean, the won't, we won't have that possibility. To get some feedback from the public. Well, on, if, we, on, on it won't, if, you, if we don't do it tonight, it's not going to happen for 14. It, and, and if it doesn't, we're not. It won't happen. And 14 is if you look at the when everybody's running, and that's the next time school board's going to run. And then you're going to have to wait, and and that's when the majority, and when we we're going to have a lot of people running. There. And that's why I'm saying that's when the that's two years. And we've already had two cycles of elections, and it, this has not worked. And we need to change it now. Okay. Um, in, okay. We need to uh, decide how we're going to uh, do it. Well, I, I, I promised Carolyn that she could make, make a motion. Um, you, and, and Jeff has written one for you. Jeff has written. I, I may not vote for it based on what you do. <laughs> Cry. But you know what? He's that kind of guy. He'll give you the document anyway. <laughs> All right, the Cabarrus County Board of Education hereby resolves that it requests the North Carolina General Assembly to pass special legislation to set the filing date from the Cabarrus County Board of Education candidates to match the July, uh, July, uh, wait a minute, you lined something out, in the year uh, the Cabarrus County Board of Election is held filing date should be identical to those of the Cabarrus County Soil and Water Board effective for the 2014 election. Okay. There's a motion on the floor. Do I have a second? Okay. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed? Aye. Okay. I'm, I'm sorry. All those opposed, nay. We'll do nay. Okay, so that's four to two against. Do I have that right? So, yeah, six people. Okay, Ms. Murray, do you have that? Okay. But, but with the, the, we, this, this could be put on the agenda for next month, and we can still see if maybe we can fit it in. Right. Well, it, it's possible that they may still be there. It's possible that they won't. If it's something this board wants to, with a, you know, the time to do some due diligence to bring back, I think that's um, that's fine, and that's the the, the pleasure. Of the board. Me not. board members, I need a motion that the board convene in closed section, uh, closed session, pursuant to General Statute 143-318. Point one one A three to consult with an attorney employed or retained by the public body in order to preserve the attorney client privilege between the attorney and the public body, which privilege is hereby acknowledged and pursuant to general statute one four three point three one eight point one one A six to consider the qualifications, competence, performance, character, fitness, conditions of appointment or conditions of initial employment of an individual public officer or employee or prospective public officer or employee or to hear or investigate a complaint, charge or grievance by or against an individual public officer or employee. I have, a, I have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, we are now in closed session.
Good night to our viewing audience, and uh, we'll see you next time.